Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Naima Ismail. I'm the founder of Women's Wellness and Parenting Support Center. Me and Fartoon Ali will be actually hosting this event, and we would like to introduce a few people that are the guest speakers. And, and then we will also tell you like the reason and our mission is why we started our vision and going forward. And I'm hoping that you guys will learn a lot about the stigma and the mental health itself and the different um, arrange that we are seeing within our community. And the reason is we started each organization and all individuals would also explain what they have and their goals. I hope you guys gain a lot of knowledge. So, so English and My name is Fatun Ali. I'm the founder and the executive director of Somali Youth and Family Development Center. Um, today we're here to talk about mental health awareness and the stigma that it has in our community, East African community, um, and how it is affecting me as a mother and um, why I decided to create tonight. The reason that we're here tonight is this year, we're only in March, there was few suicide. Ladies, mothers killing themselves, burning themselves, hanging themselves. And it broke my heart as a mother. It was hard for me to sleep days, nights, and weeks, and I decided to do something about it and bring awareness where people don't talk about, you know, somebody dies, committed suicide, there is a reason. And we say, God bless their soul, I'm sorry, and we move on. We should not. Imagine the 14-year-old daughter saw her mother hanging. Imagine that. This is not acceptable because of, you know, people shaming people. We don't talk about it. And because people are not helping people, we don't talk about it. Tonight I'm hoping that will end and praying and hoping to God that will end. As a Somali immigrant mother, life in America is not easy for us. But at the same time, hiding our pain to the point that taking your own life away is not worth it. You need to speak up, and that's the reason you're here, all of you, to help to spread awareness, to not shame our mothers, to not shame our teenagers, to not shame our brothers, to not shame anybody. We need to speak up. We need to do something about it. We need to give them help and support. When you're that in that stage of mind, you can't think clearly for yourself. And if you're shut down, and if you're not speaking up, and if you're not saying anything, and people around you are not doing anything about it, what's gonna happen? You lose your life, whether you throw yourself in the rivers, burn yourself, or hang yourself, or overdose yourself. It's not worth it. You're here for a purpose. God made you whole and complete, and you're here for a purpose. And please, and please, Let's do something about it. Thank you so much. Private organization that has been running successfully for over 10 years, and their vision is actually, is something that's very dear to my heart when I actually read it. It's all about togetherness and humanity and breathtaking all together while the hope for the world, wellness and peace for all. I would like to welcome them and let's all Welcome 
and those wonderful ladies who come. And thank you guys. Everybody, welcome. And thank you for being here tonight. <sighs> we have a lot to learn about sharing and talking about what Fatoon has just shared with us. So breath logic teaches breath practices. And one thing that we have learned about breath practices is that they can change everything about how we think, how we feel, and how we are in the world. Breath can help us mentally, physically, and spiritually. When we practice our breath, conscious breathing, we can change those things, and it doesn't take very long. We can do these practices in a short amount of time. We can do maybe a minute here, a minute there, five minutes in the morning, in the afternoon. But we can make a difference in how we feel, and when we feel and react better, other people will react and feel better as well. So I'm just curious how many of you had to, had to stand on your feet all day? One, two, okay, several. And how many of you sat at a desk all day? A few more who were sitting at their desks. So uh, I don't know what's going on here, if it's where I'm standing or what. But I just want us for a moment to stop and check in with our body, to be aware of how we're feeling. If you're comfortable, you can lower your eyes or close them and just check in with your body. See if you notice any pain, discomfort, where it is. Notice your breath. Where do you feel your breath? Are you breathing shallowly, quickly? Do you feel it in your chest, your belly? And try to hang on to this feeling because we're going to check back in a little bit later with this, um, how we're feeling. And I know now some of you are eating, so I'm not sure how these practices are going to go. But if you're comfortable, um, I invite you to sit, sit up nice and straight and tall with your feet planted on the ground. When we have our feet planted on the ground, we can feel strength and nourishment from the earth. It supports us. It nourishes us. And we want to have nice, tall posture because when we're bent over, our breath is not flowing. We need to be sitting up nice and straight and tall, allowing our breath to flow freely. See if you can feel your breath down into your belly. And now bring your awareness up into your neck and your shoulders and just allow your neck to gently bend back and forth toward your ear towards your shoulders. No forceful movements, just relaxing into the movement. Allowing your breath to guide your movements and loosening and softening as you move. Maybe turning your head to the right and then to the left. Allowing a softness to come into those muscles. Releasing, breathing, relaxing. Coming into your own body. And 
And then rolling your shoulders forwards. One shoulder at a time or both, either, whichever feels comfortable. Again, allowing ease and comfort, nourishing your body with this practice. Softening those muscles. <sighs> Let's take a nice, slow, deep breath. And let out a sigh. <sighs> Let's do another. <sighs> this simple practice takes a little blip of time, but can change the way you feel in an instant. The sigh is our body's own natural way to let go of stress. And so we do it automatically without thinking. But if we can purposely do it, consciously do it, when we feel upset, angry, anxious, before we react to our children, or our spouses, or our coworkers. And suddenly, we can think before we act. We can react in a more calm and conscious way. It's something you can do at your desk. You can do it in your car. You can do it in the grocery store if you're feeling frustrated. It's a beautiful practice, very simple. the relaxing movements of your neck and shoulders. You can do that once every hour if you're working at a computer or whatever you're doing. You can just take a moment to do those relaxing movements. It doesn't take long and it starts to release that stress. <clears throat> These breathing practices can help us be more focused we can actually regulate our blood pressure with these practices. We can increase our lung capacity, which is really important now with COVID. And they have many other benefits. We need to do a regular practice, however, to uh, feel the benefits of these practices. And like I said, we don't have to take an hour to do these practices. We can do one here and there, whenever something comes up. Stop and do a breath. Now, um, I'm not sure. The next breathing practices uh, might be a little challenging if we're eating. Would you, <laughs> would you like to uh, move on with the program and maybe do some of that later? What do you think? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. I think someone said we can continue. Continue? Okay. All right, I'm going to get my chair out here so that I can... I think we should come back. People are going to go pray. Oh, okay. So give us like five to ten minutes. Sure. And then we can restart. We're going to take a little five to ten minute break here, so... Okay. Let's see, I think I'll, the cord is over here. We'll work with the mic, but hopefully once we get going, you won't need the mic. I'm going to close with one breath that um, is very well known for helping people to get back to sleep if you wake up in the night or to 
just sleep better if you do it on a regular basis. It's called the relaxation breath, and that's exactly what it will do for us. And this is how it works. We inhale whatever our natural count is, and then we double the exhale. So if your natural inhale is to a count of two, you would exhale for a count of four. If your natural inhale is three, you would exhale for six. So when you're exhaling, you have to be sure and slow that down so that you have enough breath left to make it all the way. So I'm going to walk you through it a little bit using this breathing ball. And I'm going to start with a count of two and four. And at some point, I'm going to increase to four and, no, three and six, sorry. But if that isn't comfortable for you, feel free to stay breathing at two and four. Or if that's not comfortable, just pay attention to your breath. Stay inside your body and pay attention to your breath. So if you could sit up nice and straight and tall in your chairs, in your chairs, feet planted on the ground. So we're connected to that earth that supports us, cares for us. And I'm going to put the mic down now, so hopefully you can hear me. Begin to come back to the room and enjoy the rest of your dinner. Thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this program with you tonight. We are honored to be here. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, marlabadi marzadahat. In Tahadda Timid, my name is Naima Ismail. I am the founder and the executive director of Women's Wellness and Parenting Support Center. Um, it's a non private organization that supports Somali women, and we have a variety of programs that helps um, from the time they conceive to the time to the birth. We also help it through education. So you can guys check us out. It's back there. 
and follow us on Instagram. It's www.psc.mn. So to continue, I would like to welcome Sheikh Abdurrahman Bashir. He's a community educator and also has a lot of um, relations within the community. So he can tell us his experience and also what he, we can learn from him. وكورمي وحيا الله ذا كل عيكا رقوفك بني آذن كأ والله يقانو عذر رضا دنع مان تلك أه أم بدنع جرك أه الله بضا بقرآنك وكورمي لكن سي علمي أو سينس أه أيو أقاها ذي سيدا أن جعل الله هاي أو أه إنا المرك أنك أو أباها إنا للدويو أنا أرد أن أمال أين الدواء أولين وحان أركا أفريكا كيني يأي صومالي يأي جبوتي يأي صومالي لأن لكم حقا أركا تتسر السيرة دا لقوح الحري وقلو لدعا يو وقرانا لقوحنا وللي يأي داد كان وصدح شي وحال سكو كاني أو دنبيا وتتسر السيرة دا لقوح الحري كديبنا قل على لدعا يا كديبنا وحال لي هي قرآن دجها لقي قيلنا وحال وفرة يا ميكروفون هو وين بضعه كي قيل سينا يا لقاه سال لي وقع إمك وجيك بحياة المهر مركو عباضه إمك يباشو كسوت نواتي لي وحا وقتي النبي جا يا صحابة المجري فرن قف قرآن ورجو آخرني لكن سدنا لا آخرنا يا سلسلة قف لوجو حريه وحاس مجري جري وحاجرة قرآن کو ایک سوگا و رمیل قف کو وحو هشتا صدح جران جرو صدح مرحلة دود بو هشتا مرحلة دو کوبد و حالا دها سینس اهانی و قرآن هم بو حالا دها مرحلة دو قف کو عافیمات قبو وانکه هل دینا ایک مرحلة دو قف کو عافیمات قبو لبا مرحلة دو لبا دو حالا دها مرحلة دو قف کو جرن یهی و حنوسی یهی أو بكاء صبر هذا كل دول مرحلة صدحات وحالة نها مرحلة دقف كل سو علينا يا عافية كيسي دب لو جسوا علينا يا وحالة نختار دو فرين وما هي وين عافية كي قف كل سو علي ويان بركة محان دحري صدح مرحلة دقف وقف كبين هذا كي مريا تكون محال نها وحال نها قرآن كا القرآن كسو كتير وما هي قرآن کو حوی ری قف کو و لبو و جذو یه دیبت جذو و محی و مانتال و سیکولوژیکال و جذه ها گه یه جرکی سو لبو تو جذه ها و حوی ری هایی ری سورة الشمس و وضع تقانانه و نفس و ما سواها محی کتی انت های نفت بینی آدم که وحی لوس میگی وحی را دا بالانس قفك مركا وعافيمات قابو نفتيسا سيكولوجيكا لهان مانتا لهان وبالانسي سيئي دينا عم جيرو بالانس كيبو لالنا يا قفكا محالة دها وعافيمات قابا قفكا محالة دها وعافيمات قابا حقيقة وعافيمات قابا وقودها جيركا الإلهي محوري لقد سورة تين خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم قفكا بني آدم كوحانو أبو الري سي بالانس يا أو ميزان سن ووضع الميزان إلهي ميزان بودك علماء إيمي كوزير علماء محي هذا ما كقال يعني عذرك ومحي وبالانس كيو خلطة ماي إيمي كمان كلقول يه هبل ديكر بولا يه أبي هبل أي ديكر بلا داي محي كذي أنت هاي وحي كذي أنت هاي ميزان كي باقل ماي اختلال داي ميزان كوا محي وبقول يه لباتن يه سديتن أوكي هذا يه سديته كسوق عو سجاشن يه بقول يمادو ميزان كي محاكو دعي او قريري او قلطبي هادو بغل يلا باتن كي كور او كعو او نغضو بغل يكتن بغل يحدن دي كرجل هادو كرد دعي انتانا وحاوية دي كركي با دعي 
محمد كان قف خد عي ميزان كي بقى قلده ماي برك القرآن هو حكاه اللي ميزان كإن لا إلهيو هل كجر كنا وإن لا إلهيو هل كمان تل كنا وإن لا إلهيو إنتو عيور كقول عيب بقى سير الله إلهي يا من حين نصوا بدك يا قرآنك صدق شيء سير الله إلهي وإلهي إنتو حكاه لنا لمبر وان وحي نصوا بدك هاي إن لون نه الله هذا سيدكن أرجع حنا لسك إلهيو إن لون نه الله هذا سيدكن أرجع حنا لسك إلهيو كو لابا قرآن كوحي نوش هاكي جركا إيو قدو هو استعصيريان إمي كوحا جرا علم اللي دهدو علم النفس الجسمي أفك عربي قال وعلم السيكولوجي قال كجركا قفك بني آدم كأه دكتر كمركا تكتين دكتر كو هدو حريفي هاي وعلمي بذن ليه هاي دوكو لما تدقيو وكو رئيسان ايا قف بها جرا جركا يسر دباتة قبل لكن قدوه سيارة ضعيفة حبانت إيه الميزان كالو سرعش إن حوق القصيو، إن لقولة تليو، إن لجوانيو، إن على لقطة صع، وحيال بعضنا، لأن جركو وقط أسرة، هوستا هوستا وقط أسرة، جركا، أريد أصدق هذا وخطرت أويان، وعافيماتك وقرانك إن السيوح ويان، حفظ الصحة وتعزيز الصحة، وعلى قرانك إلى لي عافيماتك، قفكو أنت أتى على كونتك، مارد كونتك، بنك بنك كونتاتك، بنك يا، لعكت أديجتي، ما هيكو سيسا. وحيكو سيسا أنشرش بيكو سيسا والله جبكاك ما بعنوه واسكن الله كرتا العقوة هزتا بقولكم لو بقول بيكو جيرتا الحمد لله أفريقيا تي كرتا وصير عيار كرتا هو يا زيارة كرتا العقبة غادي كرتا لكن هادو يا هاي بانكو بيجور نفط رجح بكون عيا سداس وكل الجيرك ينوحو بهاي إن كيد لورد قص يلا قولي يا كيد كم يسبور العيارة إن عطوا في على عنو إن نفط هذا الدجيو إن مارة المسكة هذا اللي كبيو إلا الراحيس تو راح أدتك وراح أضبي قرآن أنا واحد هذا أدتك بيني أنا كقارن واحد كده ها بين كي أنت السياح نفط الراحيس تو مثل أي كده هذا سيرن الراحيس تا نفط هذا أشياء كي واحد هذا نين كستي يقبل كسر نفط هذا أشياء كيسا وعفما تقبطه وأنا جيزي أبا جيزي نفط محل لقش يا كيا واي وطفي عن تاي وعفما تقبطه وتحوك بزن تاي وتقولي سنتون تا وحوك بزن سنتون تا هل كده نفط كوا قديد دا دام بات هاي محمد تريسيد ولا قاعد كهذي ويكون قفصتي وادي من أي ساعة عذر باكو هيا خلاص نين قالوا مريكة نوح قري بوق عجيب نين مريكة نبوق عجيب وقري وحو قري وبوق حديث بوق فقسيه وحو قري سادو فكرة سيد بعد هاني صار كما تفكروا تكون سادو فكرة سيد إياتها صدق على مركب محاين قرنه وهذو قفكو جرية جرنين وعافمات قبسوا إلى شلها لنا عكلاني ما لنا قفك واحد واحد نوصل ياجا علمي جا قالوا ده ما توحوا قاره لنا بهار صار لكن واحد نيشة جا طبعا إيه كو قرني وكون إيه بقول سنة كهر لنا هذا أبو زيد البلخي ومسلم أبو زيد محل هذا البلخي وحوق ري بوجو بحيه أنت رأس كجركة إيه مانتالك سكولوجيكالك صديق قفك لود ويا بوجا إيه مكوا الله قاضي جامعة هذا قال هذا يوروب يوم مريكم أنا بالوري ثا واحد موسى يوم مات نوري وحي نصه بند جاي يذا لا لبدو دوده كوا دوده كاي دقي سو هداد سيكولوجيكال ما نتالهان هداد حنوستيد دوده وام حي إن إذا أني جا كل أني جا أني جا أنو كم تخصصين سد ما نتال كلو دوي ما نتال كذا تكو تخصصي أو دوي ذات كأو تكبو كل شيء خاص سيدا هذه قاعدو دي كرقود عم حسب مارسا، رخص كذا مارسا، هادو علاشو استدر تبع حسب مارسا، شو أنا هادو قبسة حسب مارسا، رخص كذا مارسا، هادات عاوة مارتي هردوي دي ستريس 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 عاوي، والقرآن كي آخر دي والذكر كي سمارس هادرس يحوي، القرآن كي آخر الذكر سيحوي، كل علي سيحوي، هو حسوي لا تكلي جيسيد، ما يا، وصاني، دكتور كأو تجي نبي جم حول عليه السلام. تداو يا عباد الله الضومها إله يو إزدوية فإن الله لم يضع داء إلا وضع له دواء إله عذر ما أبو روح أبو رد وديسة مركا دواء جرتا دواء حاجرتا كوسوحي نيسا دواء كوسوحي نيسا با جرتا بالانسكي دواء حاجرتا كورتها لنيسا دخترك وضوء دون دواء بكو مقرية وكورتها لني لكن إذهب إليه قرآن كوحي نغو أمر إنا علمي كسيبا ويدينو قفك تخصصي فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن قلتم لا تعلمون 
أهل ذكر قوة أيوة مركا علمي كسيكولوجي قال كي ما ترك على قهله ودكتور هذا وعدد كوتا خصوصي وعدد كي يقارنا إيه جا أنكو سومالي ما نهاي أما مسلم ما نهاي وحان أنو أهمي سنة هاي إن الجيران قريه إن إن نحدي إن لفظ إنه جروه يبدأ بناء ما نهاي لكن جرد الله ما قصدوا جرد الله ما قصدوا جرد الله الله ما نوال هذا وحرض قف كصدح الريموت سما يعي جرد وكبيح كرا كو إلهي إنه بريو لمبر ون لمبر تو إنه تشدوا يا الله تشرسا هل تشدتك عادية وفي عادية درت لا تري واحد بيقول عاي هي أنا أقبو كوره هي محاوقته هي يروي سيسو بينا عبو حبسونا كدره إيش كاسه هو حد جيسه ما حكره أنا صوم مرة ويجب بحده كل اللي جاي إنه نختران هاي ما هي وحالة شرسة قف وحاية قانا هدا دون زينا بيع مش الرجيل قف تجارة كون نجح الله تشاني هدا دين برنس الشيخ بعلا تشاني هدا دكتور مركا قف دكتور أتق لا تشو لا بويا أريد أن أتحدث عن هذا الموضوع أريد أن أتحدث عن مهم كأن السميسيدة هدا واحد ريتيدو إن لتشتيدة واحد ويان نفط هذا سيدنا بولا شاكيس بين أسكو شيكين بين أسكو شيكين بالناس كيف أكلوا بعي ما حسبيني صحابة يكون عادي تابعين يكون عادي علماء هو يكون عادي رجوا هو يكون عادي ولذلك أبو أبو زيد البلخي وعليه كتاب جيزة دخترك وإن أردت هذا جي سنين كوا خرافات كوا خنيا كورنيا وحاك وجر إل يجن أو قرات ذات كورد ما إل يجن بيكون جوالي بقى خاصة مدور كوب إيشوك شاي جيك ولي ما هو يعني نجاي هذا أنا جيم بيجو جري كارش خسارة هبلون بيجيمد سؤاله هو يدي هو حكون هذا جيك هرت ما هو حكوت خصوصي هبلها ينو قال ولي ما هو حصي قال هبلها حجاب هبلها حجاب إنه بصي قال ولي ما هو حصي قال كوي عبادة بدن هو جيك هو هبلها يبي ما نخو من قط خصوصي أوكي إمي كوحة كفر الدوك إسلام كورن أنا وأنا أقول هنا صد بدن يسوي ورد دوران وده بزنس وده يوحني وحنا بزنس وها وبزنس وحني ما هالدين ما ها بيدت كروشة مرة تبيو كروشة ب ب ب ب ب وها بزنس وحني دين ما ها وحني وحويان صحابة دين النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا فرد دكتور وكده ويو تذكر جيك هكسره الله يكرم نين صحابة دي بقولكم بس صحابة هاي أنا نين قرأ أو صحابة دي أما قبل صحابة ده أو تذكر جيك هكسره الله يكرم لا ما هي لكن قف كستون مسلمة وحاولون يسوا روح بقى يقول دعية بل مجيب بقى يقول جرا مسوا سحر مسوا إل بل الأك قرآن بقول أخني واللي بوحى في عنا أذو قرآن كسب أخني أنا يقول إن إلهي كاجر وهي كوشة من الأذو إلهي كاجر ويت أنا يقول إن إلهي كاج كاج عليه هي كوشة من الأذو إلهي كاج عليه مركا قد روفت يدوني في عنا هي كوشة من لو تاضي كف عنا إلهي وحنا نجرنا ونم إمجاسه أك أنكم مجرد تكنيس الله تقول هذا أدي يا إلهي مثل يه يا إلهي إله هذا الله الباك قرع وحاسمه دين تنا النبي يقول حد هذا الباك قرعه أنا وان قرع عاشا أوليك تري النبي إلهي الباك هي قرع مارك تنا ماي ويقرع عني سون جنا سنا وقرع عني الباك إلهي مارك قفك في عنا النبي يقول جوا ندعي مارك هذا كم قتها ندعي ما يقول دعي ما هذا أنا كم قرع إخواني مارك سو عربة هنعي وحن واجر وعذر إسلام كروح قتلا واجر وأنا جاي نيشة يا بو جاس جامعة ده أدونك هارفر أدونك رول ورقته وحال قرية كون يا بقول صار كهر وحال قرية أبو زيد البلخي وحال ده مصالح الأبدان والأنفس وعقود الجمية إنجليز وعقود الجمية فرنسيز وعقود الجمية هاي أفروش أفف كورن ميكا وحال لقدر جاي وحال دوانين مانتا نول وانويك أو بحنا يو ووانويك دخترضوا أي مانتا بحيان مسلم بونا أهانا عقيدة دي سوفي عن تهاي علماء دارن أبو ابن حجر وعوري وحوقها كان نوع شخصا نوعنا أقوم بدر دين عمارته علم جمع تلك مركها دين تين ودين تام عن في عن إيه ونحسن وحنقول لكم فرح سنة هاي قبلها برنامج كم وضع أهمية دين تلك سنة يا والله الله يو هكذا دارينا يا هدارينا يا هدارينا دتك إنه ولا قد دارينا هكذا دارينا شق هذا وضع كوات كذا أنا كنا ونجرب جورا إن شاء الله تعالى أنت أنكرينا إله نجابال مريو بارك الله فيكم يا سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.
الصومالي إلا فهم أنهم لنا يا يا أسوء في الصومالي يقولوا أفكر يجبوتيها يا كيف تربيني شيء يا أنا ما حاجة في الصومالي يقولوا كورة شيء كسماء يقولوا كورة شيء الصومالي كسماء يقولوا كورة شيء ظن رزعة قبل كسيبوا على فريق العروية المقال هذا حمرنا وكويرا وكبارو قي مركا وقبل هذا نحس على مرات بنت الذي سو قالنا وحن نقد دنيا را دنيا را مركا ولسعانود وقبل كصبال القلبادي يا ميلها صعدنا وعقل جيبه أبو السبي وكصور دقاء قمرك وهرجيزة كسي بحيو وحن نقد دوين مركا وبور مسو قالنا ويرد قومي جبوتي مركا بدنا واسع سقي مركا رجل جبوتي وحو كورنا يا وحان يدي وحان يدي وقال وروحان يدي ما هن وحان إدرة ده آه وحان يدي بقول رجل جبوتي أسكر ناي إنت على كلام الله إن شاء الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إيه السلام عليكم إن شاء الله I will just do a quick sort of a summary of what uh, uh, the Imam talked about, uh, the lecture. He covered the importance of uh, balance in the Quran, uh, that God created the human being in a balanced way, emotionally, mentally, physically, uh, in the optimum way. And so whenever there is some sort of an imbalance, we need to uh, pay a attention to it and seek professional help in order to get that balance back. He particularly talked about living in a stress, like if you're, he divided into cate two categories. Either you, are, you have some sort of an illness or mental health issue or whatever, or you're, you don't. So the first part he talked about was uh, in sort of if you don't, what does it mean to maintain a normal, stress-free lifestyle? And recognizing the connection between the inner emotions and your body. Uh, and he also talked about how the Quran emphasizes the need to protect the body through exercise. Uh, he also talked about how it's important to have a good self-talk, you know, and so that you are uh, thinking positively uh, about your situations and what you're going through. Uh, he also uh, talked about, he presented the ideas of a writer called Abu Zaid Balkhi, who stressed the importance of seeking professional help. Uh, and uh, he also talked about, there's a verse uh, in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلُوا ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you don't know. Meaning, the importance of not just Asking friends, I think something is wrong with me. What do you think? He said, when you have other type of illnesses, you go to a doctor. If you, if you have like a, you know, if your leg is injured or you're bleeding or you see a physical thing, you actually go to a doctor. And he said, this is the same thing. You need to go to uh, and get, you know, a mental health professional and, and, and seek help. This is in line with the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, he also talked about, he offered three ways to seek a cure. This was his final thing. Uh, number one, make dua to Allah, which means seek uh, supplication. Uh, prayer is number one. And number two, consulting with a professional. And number three, being honest with oneself and not be in denial. Because the sooner you seek help, the better. Uh, and he also emphasized the impor importance of encouraging and this group to keep going. This is a very important topic that we need more and more uh, spaces to talk about. So I just wanted to summarize for you guys. Thank you so much.
Okay, let me introduce the next speaker, um, Dr. Abi Bashir. is a recent graduate, uh, doctoral graduate in clinical psychology with specializing in trauma, neuro neurology, trauma neurology of trauma and development. She, she focused on her, her research and community work um, in impacted clinics, government agencies, Advocacy organization is that work with BIPA community, Im immigration community in Minnesota. Dr. Bash Bashir is an advocate in cultural appropriate mental health care, has founded Let's Talk Healing, which is back there for all of you who don't know, and her business cards and information is also back there if you would like to connect. Um, she provides a cultural sensitive mental health ABA services to adults with mental health concerns and a children with their developmental, developmental disabilities. Her dissertation research topics focused on understanding the barrier to care for 1.5 generation Somali American in Minnesota and goal of contributing on research and that informs working with uh, children of immigrant, Dr. Bashir has also founded um, and contributed a, a research aspect, which is um, a Snapchat channel that offers information and resources uh, to the community members that want to understand more about mental health and stigma. Overall, Dr. Bashir has recognized the gap in care and and I'm committed to provide a cultural sensitive mental health care to a diversity of populations. Also, Dr. Bashir has prepared us a PowerPoint that is very informational. And let's welcome Dr. Bashir. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties there. Um, salami Somali. Everyone, salam alaikum. For those of you who do not speak Somali, hello. Blessings on you too as well. I am Dr. Abian Bashir, um, and today I'm going to talk about um, really mental health as, uh, overall in general. Specifically, um, for someone wanted me to focus on. Um, uh, symptoms and to also focus on just generally what we need to know as a community as it relates to mental health services um, and mental health. Um, so just with regards to my background, um, my doctorate is in clinical psychology. Uh, before that, I was a social worker, so doing a lot of the groundwork stuff to help me figure out kind of what is it that we need. Um, and a lot of it, honestly, a lot of my experience came from not only being part of the community, but also kind of seeing what everybody's up against when it comes to the BIPOC community, but also our immigrant communities. Um, and a lots, lots, and lots of li lived experience. Um, and so some of that I think is also very helpful. So today I just wanna um, talk a little bit about uh, mental health symptoms as it relates to um, what are some things that we need to know with regards to what to look out for. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with, uh, as a community, you know, when we think about, oh, sorry. Um, as a community, when we think about mental health symptoms, um, you know, I, I think there are kind of categories where people hear depression and they have their own assumptions and understanding of what that is. Um, and oftentimes it's usually within our community um, either, you know, attributed to some sort of a lack of faith or something is going on. Um, and, you know, I, I really appreciated that share that came up um, because it is true, just like, you know, we can have physical health issues as being the test that we have to kind of withstand, um, similar to that if you're coming from a spiritual and a religious explanation, I think it's important that we, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's just a, a disservice and injustice to those folks who, you know, maybe are spiritually connected, but because they're having difficulties with their mental health, may, you know, kind of contribute that to maybe their lack of faith. And so that's definitely not the case. And you heard the sheikh say it, I'm not a sheikh. So <laughs> make sure that I put that out there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about kind of within our own community, um, what are some of the issues that may come up with depression? I, I think um, as a community, we are definitely um, at a very high risk for developing, you know, significant mental health issues because of the environmental factors and the historic, historical factors that we um, have had to live through, right? Um, given that we are a population um, and a community that's lived through war and displacement and through racism here in this country as well. I mean, these are just kind of stacking up as they go. And so 
it's almost like I said, um, just an in-service for us not to acknowledge how these uh, events uh, can have a psychological impact, not only on us individually, but also as a community, also as a family unit. And quite frankly speaking, uh, for my Somali communities, there's a lot of things that we normalize as a way of being Somali, right? That sometimes doesn't necessarily feel um, like, oh, you don't fit in or something is going on. But you know, when I dug deep, there was a lot of toxicity in the things that we considered Somali Nemo. And that's, it's not because it's a bad thing, but because of how we relate with one another over time. Um, you know, when, a, when a whole family is impacted by trauma, um, how we relate with each other and how we connect with each other is going to definitely be impacted. And so sometimes there might be some things that we might just kind of throw out there willy-nilly, right? That might be, um, you know, personalities or things in which we deal with situations that are not necessarily about, you know, Somali Nima or anything like that. It's, it's, it's about trauma. It's a trauma response, right? And so I want to talk about this today. And so I'm not going to talk uh, you know, individually about every symptoms. I think that you guys can always Google that type of information, but I really want to um, kind of, um, uh, kind of from a, a general, more broad uh, way, talk about some of the symptoms that people might experience because I don't know that if I had not gotten the training and education that I have, that I would have necessarily thought of these things as symptoms, right? Um, and so we'll just kind of go through them, but I won't go into too de much of a detail. Um, you know, experiencing, or if, and this might be helpful for you also as you are thinking about your own family members and the, some of the people that you have around you who may um, be having a change in behavior or personality traits, things like that. It allows you to just kind of, you know, have a mental note to see if maybe you can get them some help or get them connect somewhere or just, you know, gain enough information for yourself so that you can um, help them to whatever degree that you're able to. So with depression, major depressive, um, depressed mood, feeling numb, irritability. Um, how many of you have, 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 have you know, and within the Somali community, uh, you know, right? Like, right? Things like this, or the translation for this is somebody's really irritable, or they're hot-headed, or, you know, they, they're really reactive. Things like this may be, you know, either symptoms of uh, some sort of, you know, um, anxiety or depression, but it also can be complex PTSD or PTSD, and I'll get to it later on, but more around trauma. If you start to see people who are experiencing, um, you know, they're not enjoying the things that they used to enjoy. So you see someone who's really excited about basketball and you used to play basketball all the time, all of a sudden, they're not going out, they're not, you know, hanging out with friends, they're not interested in basketball, whatever it is that was um, an interest of theirs. Um, anytime you see any kind of appetite changes, a significant change in weight or any, you know, all of a sudden somebody who was not much of an eater is eating away all the time and has gained a lot of weight, right? Um, and also it could be on the opposite end. Um, if somebody is uh, usually uh, much, you know, kind of uh, had a certain weight their whole life and they're losing weight tremendously because they're not eating. Um, fatigue and loss of energy, oftentimes I don't think people think about stuff like this, um, but if you're ever experiencing any kind of um, tiredness or fatigue, um, depression is not just mood, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how they manifest themselves physically because our minds and bodies are connected. Um, our gut, our mind, and body are connected, and so uh, oftentimes I don't think that we think much about that. Um, there's a sense of feeling of guilt and worthlessness. Um, again, these can be contributed to many other things. Um, their root causes, I'll get to it later. Sleep difficulties, um, psychomotor agitation. Um, that's really just um, how the person is moving. If somebody was kind of really, you know, on the go and they're, they're, they're you know, the best way that I can illustrate it is to find somebody kind of moving really slow, thinking really slow, talking really slow. Again, that could also be uh, something that has to do with their mental health. Sleep difficulties. Difficulties, I think this is very much obvious for, for very, uh, very many people. Like when you're not sleeping, you kind of know you're up because you're stressed out, you're thinking, something's going on, right? And then, of course, suicidal ideations and thoughts. And as a, some, as a community, I think we just need to, like, point out the elephant in the room, guys. <laughs> I know we don't want to talk about this. I know that this is often not something that we want to acknowledge because we do, you know, um, we do, uh, we do have, a, we, have, we have religious beliefs that say that that is not okay, which obviously can be uh, a great protective factor, um, but it's not necessarily something that's going to keep somebody from doing something like that if they're under the state of mind where they're experiencing a lot of distress and a lot of anxiety and depression. And so I think just being able to um, acknowledge that, I think once we're able to just kind of um, point it out in the, in the room and not, you know, tiptoe around it, it's a real thing. You know, people experience a level of distress which 
it's completely normal for the brain to say, I don't want to be here because this sucks, right? I don't want to be here because this is horrible. I, I'm dealing with a lot. So I wouldn't necessarily think about it as something that's extremely, like, yes, we don't want to lose a life, but the root cause, the kind of the explanation that, that, uh, that explains that type of behavior is your brain is this amazing organ that uh, its main job is to keep you surviving. It's to keep you um, healthy and well and without threat, right? And so if there's enough environmental stressors and threat to your system, it's a way that the system says, all right, well, we don't want to deal with this, right? Um, doesn't mean that that's what, where we want to go, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge why our brains go that way. Um, similar with other, um, and I'll get to that when we get to trauma. Another thing I just kind of want to talk a little bit about is anxiety, symptoms that people usually experience. Um, as a community, we might go to the hospital and, be, and say things like, you know, I'm having a lot of physical ailments, right? Because usually people are not able to identify when they're experiencing the behavioral aspects of, or the psychological aspects of anxiety. They might say, you know, I've, I've been having stomach aches, I've been experiencing a lot of chest pains, I've been experiencing a lot of, like, kind of sweats and night terrors and things like that. Um, but some of the things that can come up is if there's a lot of worries, and I, I do want to add that there is a, a normal level of anxiety and depression that happens as humans, right? But when it gets to the point where it impacts your functioning, when it gets to a point where it impacts your ability to show up for your family, your ability to work, your ability to connect with other folks, then that's when you start to think, all right, maybe it's become a problem. Because I, I would be remiss if I said that I don't have days where I'm just like, ah, I don't want to do anything, right? Or that you, you're just feeling a little anxious. I was anxious coming up to the stage right now, right? <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm, I've got anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder, right? Um, so some of these ways in which our systems is, is operated either motivates us or you know, um, kind of repels us from any kind of danger. Um, these are symptoms that I'm talking about that in the event that you know, they, they, get, they become so significant in your life and you're not able to do a lot of stuff and things, uh, things in your life, like you're not going to work, you're not taking care of your kids, um, it's really impacting your life in a negative way. And so some of the things to think about is worry, difficulty, controlling worry, irritability, Restlessness. Restlessness is like this inability to relax. So if you've got a mind that's continuously just rolling and going and you're just not able to shut that off, that's probably something that you want to uh, get checked out. Um, muscle tension, difficulties with concentration, and sleep again. And so this is kind of where I um, like to talk about just because I think there's a lot that can fit under this. Um, trauma, when we think about trauma, it could be any significant event or series of events or sets of circumstances that, that a person experiences um, where the person feels a psychological harm from it. So in other words, this doesn't mean that everybody that goes through some sort of a um, war issue or some sort of traumatic event is going to necessarily going to have trauma or excuse me, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, or anything that has to do with like the diagnoses. But it's how we respond, right? So one person could be walking down the street, um, you know, and somebody just kind of startles them. That could be a very, you know, traumatic event for somebody. Maybe while another person might, it might not be as a traumatic event, right? And so really that is defined by the person and there's a lot of, um, kind of background, I, I guess, you know, ge uh, genetic predisposition, you know, um, DNA, right? Um, the family history, the family mental health history that we have, all these things play a factor in which whether somebody develops a mental health issue or not. And sometimes none of it exists and it happens, right? And so some of the trauma, like some of the trauma and traumatic events this may include is sexual assaults, sexual abuse, domestic violence. I mean, these are the big ones, interpersonal violence, witnessing of any kind of violence. So any kind of violence that's going on in the home and if there's a child you know, being raised in that home and what they're witnessing. Um, and the other examples are uh, more of the uh, public or kind of societal traumas that can happen. And this includes natural disasters, uh, war or community violence. For most of us in the Somali community, it's not something that we've chose. However, I think there's a lot of people who uh, don't know that that has an impact on generations after, right? So this doesn't mean that the initial generation that had gone through the war is necessarily where, where the trauma is going to stop. But there's intergenerational trauma that's let, you know, more likely to impact you know, second generation, third generation, and what have you. Similar to what happened to African Americans in this community as well as Native Americans. These are historical traumas that we need to be cognizant of, like just as it relates to 
um, the experiences that we have. And so maybe you're fine and you're like, well, you know what, I've went through X, Y, and Z, my kids, because we hear these stories, my kids are living safe, they're in America, they're getting a good education. What are you talking about? How is he depressed or anxious? Well, genetics. <laughs> um, and there's also um, epigenetics. Epigenetics is, the, is, is an understanding that when um, people go through uh, you know, significant war traumas, that the impact that it has on their physical health, if they are not carrying, most likely every woman has all the eggs that she's going to be born with. And so epigenetics states that you know, it, can, it, can, it can impact your kind of DNA setup and, as, and how you're going to pretty much pass it on. Um, and so I think it's important to think about some of that too. As we think about our young, um, our, our second generation Somali Americans here, right? Um, and some of the challenges that they're up against. I mean, they're up against quite a bit of challenges with identity, with you know, mental health. And there's a lot of stuff that I think sometimes parents kind of overlook when, when we think about some of our teenagers who are having a difficult time and we're just like, well, why? They have, they're living the life. Well, they're not, not, not so much internally. So we need to be able to be cognizant of that as well. And so trauma is something that overwhelms our coping mechanism. It, it overwhelms all of our system. And so if you are a person who's able to hold a lot of information, do a lot of things, um, when trauma impacts us, it overwhelms a system that it, it, you know, it's really hard to do things the way that you used to be able to do it. But it affects our whole self, your identity, how you see the world, how you see people. Um, it also impacts our physical and emotional health. It impacts our intellectual health. And it also impacts our spiritual well-being as well. And so I don't want to go into it um, very detailed, but I, I like to talk about the impact of trauma because I don't think they're necessarily things that people can see, right? Um, one of the things I like to take for an example is, um, you know, there's this kind of uh, connection or lack of connection with other people that people who've experienced or who've had any kind of war trauma may have a difficult time trusting people. But they might think that that is just kind of a normal thing. Well, you just, you just don't trust people, right? That's not usually how it works out, right? Um, but also, like, an inability to keep your relationships healthy, right? An inability to keep relationships, whether it's a romantic relationship, relationship with your family, with your, with your children, but relationships and connection are super hard because, again, trauma it really, um, uh, you know, it impacts the foundation in which we connect with other people. And as humans, we are made to connect. Our natural disposition is to connect with other people, is to be safe, is to do all these things without having to think about this extra kind of threat system. And so some of the ways in which trauma can show up is um, intrusive thoughts. This is, you know, uh, kind of an involuntary, um, you know, uh, an uninvited uh, thoughts and feelings about uh, things that you don't want to think about. And sometimes here and there, there's a normal aspect of getting, you know, having to do that where you might remember something and you don't like it, but there's an ability to control it. With trauma, um, sometimes it gets really difficult to control it. And so for folks that feel like that's just something that comes up all the time, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely something to look, um, look into. Avoidance is another way. If you're avoiding places, things, or people that might uh, remind you of a certain situation. Um, and sometimes this is happening unconsciously. Um, and so it's not that, you know, I don't want to paint the picture that people kind of know this, but if, if people tend to realize that, you know, they tend to not go to certain places and, you know, as they reflect on it, they realize, okay, that's probably what it is. And the amazing thing about our brain is it has this association of things. And so let's say you have a fear of birds you know, at some point through association, it's going to turn into you being afraid of everything that flies, right? To, um, you know, it, it might be where, you know, anything that flies and where it's at. And so this, this association with different topics and categories over time um, gets, into play, it gets into a situation where you might actually be staying home all day or not wanting to interact with people and what have you. Um, so changes in thoughts and moods. This is an ability to recall aspects of the trauma. So this is totally normal. This is a way of your uh, body, your brain really protecting you because if you remember it, it's more detrimental to your health. And so you might, you might see that uh, a big significant event happened or a traumatic event happened, yet you don't remember. Um, negative beliefs about yourself, others in the world. Distorted cognitions about the causes. This just means you really don't remember or you don't really understand, you know, um, or you might have a different interpretation of why something happened. Sometimes this can happen in uh, abuse situations where there's a different interpretation for why the situation took place. Um, negative state, emotional state. So this is fear, guilt, horror, and shame. 
Um, and I, I think I want to elaborate a little bit more about the shame, because I think as a culture, we do have an ab culture, right? Um, we, we have this kind of, and you know, maybe it's making a lot of people uncomfortable, but this is my job, and this is what I'm supposed to do. And I think it's important that if we're brave enough to talk about these things with one another, that there's going to be some change for the next generation. And that maybe our children, or you know, our, our teenagers, are not going to be struggling with such significant opioid crisis, because I think, it's, I think it's a disservice if we just don't pay attention to it. But what do we tend to do when things get uncomfortable, when things happen in households? There's this idea of like not talking about it. Like it's completely swept under the rug. Um, and I would be remiss to say how many, you know, clients I have in therapy who, you know, have, have, have been told that they can't talk about these things because as a culture we don't. But that's not to say that, you know, it's a bad thing. It's just the way that we always used to do things. We have to acknowledge that it does not help us. It's not, it, it's not doing any good for our well-being. And, and, and yes, it's difficult to change cultural things that have been happening and passed down generations after generation. Um, but I, I, I think it's, a, and it's an important thing that at least for us to ponder on and to, th and to think about because the ab culture is not the shame culture, the ab culture, it's not serving us as a community. Um, and so, um, yep, and one of the other things is diminish interest in activities. Um, a sense of feeling detachment. Oftentimes people who are experiencing traumatic symptoms or any kind of um, um, issues with connection is that they, they, they have a really difficult time connecting with people. Um, you know, they meet people, everything is great, but really that ability to be able to, um, you know, be vulnerable as, as well, and not to say that you're supposed to be vulnerable with everybody, but it's a lack of connection. It's a difficulty being able to connect with other human beings. And then there's an inability to experience positive emotions. And I want you guys just to po just ponder on that. Like, if there's happy situations, sometimes trauma robs you of that experience. You aren't able to enjoy that experience because you you know the, that that experience of of having these positive emotions are difficult. Um, all right, um, changes in arousal and reactivity. This is again. Um, Again, around trauma, if you're noticing a lot of irritability or, anxiety or angry outbursts, this is reckless behavior, so not unexplained. If you see other people engaging in, and this might not be something that you're experiencing, I just want you to take notes so that you're able to go back and pay attention to the people in your life, the people that you love, you know, their children. And if you notice these things, because they're not, you, you, the lay person isn't meant to notice these things like a clinician is. But if you're able to have some of these no this knowledge for yourself, then you go out and you're able to see some things and maybe you can have a private conversation like, hey, such and such was talking about that, you know, this might be going on. I wonder if you, get, you should get something checked out or I wonder if you should just do a little bit of more research. Um, there is also like hypervigilance, so absent, right? Kind of like checking, checking where you're at, what you're doing. Absent, sorry, you guys, I thought I was in the room with only Somalis. <laughs> Fear, hypervigilance, it's when um, you're experiencing kind of this sense of like always being aware of your surrounding. That's not normal all the time. Now should you be, you know, you shouldn't be around like walking around recklessly and not thinking about where you're at. But this hypervigilance is a, you know, um, an extra sense of making sure where you are is safe. You're, you're checking the people that you're with, all of these things. And this is also a product of uh, um, trauma. Uh, sleep difficulties, difficulties with concentration and attention. Um, sometimes this can also be linked to other things like the ADHD, but what we know, and anxiety. But what we know about trauma is, you know, when our limbic system is 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 heightened, it doesn't allow us to have the front of our brain, which is the part of our thinking brain, on. And so when you're scared, you're not learning. When you're scared, you can't, you don't, you, 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 you don't have the ability to have the attention to take in this information. And so sometimes when things are going, you know, when things are hard at home or families are not getting the supports that they need, we find that some of our kids are having a hard time at, at school, right? And so if the home environment is destructive, it's scary, there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of um, 
unmet needs, then it's difficult and actually uh, quite a significant ask for a child to learn when you know the environment is unsafe. Because again, when your limbic system, which is the emotional parts of your brain, in charge to, in charge of like your ability to be safe and connected, when that part is not when it's when it's more activated than it is in our our, our prefrontal cortex, which is the the the, the, t the thinking the cognitive parts of our brain, they're they're not on at the same time, and so something needs to happen to you know, calm and regulate our emotional limbic system to be able to have more, you know, just more resources to be able to access our uh, uh, pref prefrontal cortex, our thinking parts of our brain. All right, so I wanted to end with talking a little bit about ACEs. Anybody heard about what the ACEs are? The ACEs? All right, I got a few people. Okay, so the ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, and um, what we, the, 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 the study was done, and what they found that is if there are, ACEs are pretty much adverse childhood experiences. This can include, um, you know, physical abuse, um, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Um, it can also include, um, um, I, I included actually the international ACEs because um, I thought it would be more appropriate for this population or kind of the, the sorry, give me just a second. I just want to read some of this off. Uh, there it is. Okay, so some of the things that we need to think about as it relates to the ACEs is, um, let's see, there it is. So physical abuse, and this is the international ACEs. So this includes war trauma and things like that. So uh, the ACEs are physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, a family member being addicted to alcohol or any kind of substances, family members who are in prison, um, family members who are experiencing or witnessing another family member who has a mental health issue, witnessing a parent being abused, one or no parents, any kind of separation or divorce, emotional neglect, physical neglect, uh, neglect bullying, community violence, um, and collective violence. Now, based off of how many of those ACEs you say yes to, essentially what it is saying is that these experiences could include things that, or excuse me, these experiences could increase chronic uh, physical health issues later on in adulthood. And so think about that for a second, because when I first learned about this, I was like, oh my God, this is just insane. But, but if you think about it, if you have enough excessive, if there's excessive toxic stress to the body continuously and chronically, over and over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, you guys get the point. What happens to your body? What happens to all, think about all of that stress hormones that are released to your body. It's going to impact your lungs, right, your heart. It's going to impact, you know, um, your, your ability for your body to, you know, function in the way that it does. And so what this study found is that people who had X amount of you know ACEs points had a um, higher it had uh, I guess had what were more prone to have health issues more like chronic and long-term health issues we're talking health heart issues cholesterol diabetes I mean some of these uh, more serious health issues and so the more ACEs a child experiences at a young age the more likely he or she uh, is to suffer things such as, again, heart disease, diabetes, poor academic uh, achievements. So not just the, you know, from the health side of things, but also their academic um, aspirations, right? And be able, able to perform like the, I mean, um, as well as their peers. And so trauma is really truly a, um, you know, it, it, it really impacts a child to a point where, you know, not only does it affect their ability to connect with people and relationships as they get older, but their ability to do well and have uh, a successful, successful academic career or anything like that, but also their ability to um, stay healthy. Um, and so before I move on to that, next slide, there's a few things I wanted to say about this. So I don't want to leave you with ACEs and think that it's loom and gloom. It is not loom and gloom. <laughs> we are resilient human beings. And um, ACE scores, now ACE scores is only one part of the picture. Um, resiliency, the ability to bounce back, which I think as a community we do an amazing job um, just with everything that we've been able to accomplish. Yes, do we still have our challenges? Yes, do we still have these you know, experiences and things that we might need to engage in a little bit more to um, kind of help our younger generation, but also be willing to seek services ourselves and normalize it for the people that we love? I think as a community we came far. Um, and we've been doing an amazing job, and we have that ability to 
bounce back. Not all of us do, but I want to make sure that I, you know, I, I want to say as a community, we are also thriving here in Minnesota. And I think it's important that we talk about some of our strengths as well as some of the challenges that we have. And so the ability to bounce back when the child who is experiencing, you know, X number of ACEs, when they have a supportive, healthy adult in their life, you could prevent the, the impact of ACEs. So that means you can prevent academic, um, uh, you know, lack of, lack of academic performance. You can also um, um, prevent any of these like serious diseases as they, you know, get older when it comes to their physical health. And so um, I'm going to skip some of this because I think I'm a little over time and get to resilient factors. And so, so what can you do? Um, for those of you who are saying you shared a lot with us, this is a lot of information also. It's like kind of hard information at times. Um, but there's resources out there. There's something that we can all do to make sure that we all take care of ourselves and our family members. One of the things that I often do is, you know, spiritual resources. We're uh, a collective that's a spiritual collective, you know, um, community. We use Islamic principles and values to be able to heal through them. And there's many clients who I work with where that is just what they need to be able to kind of work through some of these difficult times. However, um, you know, it's not always that's the only thing you need. I understand that we all have... Um, you know, a wide range of religious, you know, like a, a wide range of religiosity and where we are in terms of where all of those things. So it's definitely not the only thing you can do, but certainly something you can start with, right? Um, individual and community values based on decisions. When we make decisions that are hard, but that is beneficial for our community, that's beneficial for the, our children, then we heal as a community. However, when we turn, you know, kind of turn a cheek then it's not, it's not value-based and it's not helpful for our community. Strong relationships, uh, family, friends, and mentors, positive role models, um, cultural connections. Um, when somebody shares that they've had a situation that happened, I hope that, you know, that, that, that we believe them, specifically women, right? Specifically women. I hope that when other women come and talk about their experiences to you all, that you know that you listen. You may not be able to help them, but that you can listen to them, you can validate them, you can believe that their experiences are true, and you know, maybe get them connected to some work. That is also healing. Healing is not only in the therapy office, right? Healing is not only psychotherapy, y'all. We we can you can be an agent of healing for people who are going through some of that because through you they can be connected to a professional, somebody that might help them. Um, professional counseling. Um, Let's Talk Healing provides culturally specific, culturally sensitive mental health services. Um, I am an advocate for that within even my own profession because I think it's important that we need to continue to remember research also states that mental health has a cultural appraisal. That means the way that we think about things and how we understand things results in the way that we interpret them, right? And so I think sometimes the, the, the difficulties that other people have had when they didn't have somebody who is culturally informed is that maybe the interpretations connected to Western psychology may not be something that is helpful for them, that is something that's going to be, you know, that, that's consistent or congruent with their needs and their, their, their own belief system. And so finding a culturally responsive, culturally sensitive uh, provider for somebody is, is, is really important. At, at best, I think if a provider definitely you know, knows about the cultural impacts and understands some of these things, then, you know, um, then I, I think that there will be some, some help there. I think sometimes when there isn't, there's more harm than not. Um, connections, guys, story sharing, I mean, uh, sharing stories and emotions, laughing and crying together. Um, and I think as a community, we do that through poetry, right? We do that through some of our um, folktale kind of um, brambur, right? Is that what it's called? Brambur. It's called brambur. But the, sometimes it's not for weddings, right? Sometimes it's like to honor somebody else and they, they say good things. I mean, these are already existing cultural practices that we have as a community. And it's so important to, say, you know, you don't just throw them out. Those are ex exactly the, the, the healing practices we can continue to use that help, help us to um, get to places where we can connect with each other. And um, physical touch and comfort and connection. Um, I've talked about uh, professional counseling. You want to always go to somebody who's trauma-informed. I think it's just very important. And then engaging in life-giving activities. Um, you know, allowing yourself some grace. 
you know, you're going to make mistakes or the, you're going to go through experiences where when you were experiencing some of these symptoms, you might not be proud of the behaviors or things that you've done, right? Or you might not be proud of a family member who's done that. It's really important to, you know, show some compassion and some grace to those family members. But also if you're, if you're somebody who is healing through some trauma of an experience, to show yourself some compassion um, because that's also a healing component. Laughter, physical movement, any kind of physical exercise is really important to get through some of the mental health issues um, or uh, mental health uh, uh, difficulties that you may have. I mean, we all know that when you're exercising, you're feeling pretty good because you got endorphins releasing all these, you know, happy um, natural drugs, uh, neurotransmitters, right? When we're exercising, you probably remember that when you're looking at the mirror after a workout, right? <laughs> Okay, maybe it's just me. I'm kidding, guys. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, you're a tough crowd. <laughs> or maybe I was talking too much. I was, I was talking a lot about the seriousness of it. That The, the joke just went, well, was it, it wasn't there. Anyways, um, dancing, weightlifting, any kind of body movement really of any sort that's going to help you. Connecting with nature. So taking walks, um, going by the lake or the river, taking... Um, Intellectual curiosity, I think, um, I'm gonna go back to this slide. When you think of healing, um, healing is not just the component where you're thinking about the emotional aspect. When you're thinking about healing, healing is in four quadrants because we all have needs that are met in different quadrants. I'll take myself for an example. Now, the, in, you know, the intellectual intelligence or whatever it is, I get that a lot through work, right, or through colleagues, but if that's all I'm getting, and I'm neglecting my emotional, physical, and spiritual health. Do you think I'm, I'm, I'm happy-go-lucky and everything's all great? No. I'm probably going to be exhausted. I'm probably going to want to avoid people because I've done too much of it, right? And so the idea here is if you can fill in and get the, your needs met for each of, your, each of the quadrants, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and you know, intellectually, then you're living more of a, of a balanced healing process, right? And sometimes this might be that your emotional quadrant, you're seeing a therapist, I'm doing good, all right, fantastic. What do I need to do for physical? You know, you're going to the gym, you're doing what you need to. Um, in, in, intellectual piece, maybe you're reading a book that you're interested in, you're taking up, you know, um, um, hobbies or interests that might be of interest to you. And spiritual, it might just be you're connecting, you know, with your spiritual beliefs, whatever that may be, and to whatever degree that you are wanting. But really, just a, a good kind of overall understanding of what we all need as humans and be able to be happy and healing and, and thriving instead of surviving. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you all. If there's any questions, let me know. Uh, Farhia Budal is the first ever female Somali alcohol and drug counseling and birth recovery specialist. It's a wide recognized as a leader in substance use disorder, SUD recovery, Advo advocate, service, and service del delivery. Budol is a person with loved exp lived experience of SUD recovery. She is a voice for anime recovery need of East African Muslim community, especially women, mothers, and young adults and youth. She is the founder of NIA Recovery Institute, Institute, Institute? <laughs> the first recovery organization in the state of Minnesota in the national of um, provide services to East African Muslim community. Mia Recovery provides a cultural, cultural sensitive and res um, responsive recovery support as well as sustained recovery care after treatment. Budul is a passionate about recovery and also will, would meet on uh, the gap and the long-term recovery um, in Minnesota. In, on January, January 3rd, 2023, she was appointed on the governor's advisor, counselor on opioid substance use and addiction. Let's welcome Bodul and a well wel welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I have no way of describing this young lady, the energy she has, the young people that she's helping, the mothers that she's helping, the energy around her makes me fall. Mm. And welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mitchell. MashaAllah.
Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. My name is Farhia Budol. I know that was a long um, bio. <laughs> But in short, um, it really is, I am a woman in long-term recovery from substance use disorders, alcohol use, and what that means to me is that I can first show up for my family, I can show up for myself and my community as my authentic self. Recovery from substance use disorders has allowed me to be um, giving me back my values and my traditions as a Muslim, Somali, female living in a non-Muslim society. So I am just really grateful um, to be in recovery and also to bridge the gap for so many other people because as you all know, um, that East African and the Somali community, um, in Somali families, right, addiction and substance use disorders is often stigmatized and seen as a moral failure. Um, those, the stigma and uh, shame surrounding addiction can make it very, very um, difficult for people to really get, um, to seek help, for families to seek help um, especially with their loved ones. Uh, many f Somali families view addiction as a moral failure or lack of willpower, um, and so rather than a medical condition and a disease. So I am the founder of NIA Recovery Initiative, and what we're doing today is really using um, our recovery stories to help make an impact in, um, in our community. Um, our community right now is suffering. It's um, opioid epidemic has really hit close to home. A lot of young people are overdosing and a lot of moms and families don't really understand how to seek help how to identify when their loved one is needing help. There's not many culturally responsive recovery programs. So Nia is an Arabic word that means intention. So intentional recovery. When I was able to put my story out into the public and to everyone, I felt the sort of a freedom because I know what it's like to struggle. So we're utilizing the 12 step model of Millati Islami, which is a 12 step recovery Muslim approach where we're using the Islamic principles into our everyday recovery lives. So if you've heard of other 12 step um, models like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, and we use the same steps, but we really incorporate our Islamic principles to help people find and sustain recovery. I wanna let you know that recovery is probable, recovery is possible, and that we do recover, and that recovery is visible in the state of Minnesota. We're also known as the land of 10,000 treatment centers because recovery exists here. It really does. So when your loved one is having an issue with addiction or uh, you're understanding that he or she are exhibiting behaviors that are pertaining to this use, please do not give up hope. Do not give up hope. Seek help. Um, they, it's, it, it, it takes a lot, but you know what? We need family support, and we need to be with each other in these times right now because these times right now are very, very difficult. So come see me. We're over there. I can help you to find what recovery looks like in our community. Thank you so much. Take a breath there. Are you guys enjoying the evening? With the, with the snow, I was like kind of nervous, but I'm so glad that it all came. Um, now, this is my favorite part. This lady I'm gonna be introducing, I believe it wasn't, if it wasn't for her, I would not be here. She gave me the strength, the power to speak up, to find my inner strength. I am standing here because of her. Yeah. 
when I came to Minnesota, I was lost, confused, sad, lonely, you name it, because I was running away from domestic violence, physical, mental, emotional, financial, and all of the above. Things that we don't talk about, that's hidden in our community's stigma. stigma. That's a lot. We're hiding a lot. I don't want to hide anymore. This year, 2023, 2023 was a wake up call for me, the beginning of a new year. And hearing a two sided story, I made a decision that I cannot hide and I cannot keep my pain inside. I don't want to be putting stitches on it, covering it. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to use what I have been learning from my mentors. I have a lot of mentors that support me. Two of them are here. If it wasn't for those two ladies, I don't know what I would be and what kind of person I would come. I was lost and confused. It was 2020, sorry, it was 2011 when I found Dr. Barnab Price. When I went to her first speech, I, something told me I have to go to know that lady. I'm gonna go to know that lady. And I remember, and the person who invited me to that event uh, told me she, uh, she was local. And I bought her books. I bought the four people who can change your life. And I bought the 30 days worksheet that comes with it. I didn't know how local Dr. Varna Price was. So I started with my little bit of broken English, trying to write emails. And every time I write, I will delete because I was scared. I write, I delete, I write, I delete. I never send it. But one day, I had the courage to call, hoping that she won't answer. And I will leave a message. She answered. My heart sank. I didn't know what to say. And I tried to express my, you know, what I wanted and how I wanted to meet her and how I desperately, I really wanted to get to know her. And she said, sure, welcome. Let's have a meeting. And she was like less than a block away from me. I didn't know that, less than a block. 2021 has changed my life because of Dr. Hannah Price. She's been my mentor, my support in anything I need. Anything I need, she has been there for me, thick and through. I do girls taking action with Dr. Farna for the last nine years. And I am so grateful, so grateful. More than anything, I cannot express my feelings, how I feel about Dr. Farna Price and how she's been in my life. She completely changed who I am. She has been the mother that I needed <laughs> in my life. Thank you so much, Annie. I did this today because of the courage I got from Dr. Farno Price. I didn't tell her I was doing this, but I, when I started working on it, I called her and yes, I told her I need her to speak and come help. Without a doubt, she said when, at what time, and she's here today. I'm trying to find the email, sorry. Dr. Farna Price, Dr. Cornelia Price is an international known human potential expert who specializes in personal power, excellence. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you out of your misery. <laughs> I told 
Oh, Fatoon, do not read that bio. Every person in this room has a phone. Just Google me. Like the young people say, Google her. She just say, Dr. Verna and I show up. Um, when Miss Fatoon called me, it was late in the evening, and she was very sad, and she said, I've got to do something. And I said, well, if you get those moms in a room, I will be there. Just get them in a room. And it doesn't matter to me what kind of room it is. It can be a small room. It could be a big room. You put the call to your women, and I will show up. And this is going to be very short and very to the point, and it is for mothers. Mothers, are you in the room? Yes. Okay. All right. This lady is a rock star. Give her a hand. I love her. I love her. I would do anything for Fatun. If she had to go somewhere and leave her children, I'd take her children, her grandchildren. She knows where I live. But I, I, I do every once in a while ask her to make me those um, samosas, though they're really good. <laughs> those samosas are really good. This is going to be short, it's going to be sweet, and it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. And mothers, I am here so that when things get really hard, you have something else to reach for. You hear what I'm saying to you? Yeah. I'm not talking about your children tonight. I'm talking to you. I'm not talking about your husbands. I'm talking to you. This is just for you. Now, my very own husband is in the room. I called him because I saw that the men had come. So men, what I need you to do is before you leave, I need you to have a man conference with my husband. And here's why we need that man conference because our Somali boys are in a crisis. In our program, we have 600 students in our program. Listen to me. 21 groups of girls, 15 groups of boys, and we have a lot of Somali children. And I can tell you, our Somali boys need men. Men, I can't show up and talk to them like I'm talking to you, even though I do, and they do listen. But they need my husband, they need you men, and they need to know how to live in this society, in a dual society. Because they have one foot in Somalia and one foot in America, and they are suffering. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Now, I'm going to turn to my women. Women, the first thing I want you to do is to stand up on your feet and go and find two other women and say to them with conviction, you matter and you're worth it. So I'm going to give you one minute to find two women in the room and then come on back to your seat. Go for it. You matter and you're worth it. You matter and you're worth it. You matter and you're worth it. You're not a mama yet, but it's gonna come. All right, your minute is up. Go ahead and find your seats. Go ahead and find your seats. Okay? You matter and you're worth it. 
Go ahead and find your seats. You matter and you're worth it. You ready? <laughs> I know we're so chatty. We're so chatty. All right, go ahead and find your seat, ladies. And make sure that you save some of those hugs for the rest of the end of the night. Every woman in this room, mothers, you should know that you are not alone. You are never alone. You have a community. You have a community of women. And let me just tell you something, women. When you are in a situation where you know you're losing your mind, you know you have come to the end of yourself. You pick up that cell phone and you call your community. And you allow yourself to be totally honest. Because at that moment, it doesn't matter what people say, what they think. What only matters is that you're worth it. Make the call. Pick up that phone. Call your sisters and say, come and get me. Because I know I matter and I know I'm worth it. And why is this so true, mothers? Do you know how amazing women are? <laughs> Do you understand that God actually needed you to create? Do you understand that there's no creation that happens in this earth without a woman? Do you understand that your hand has touched every part of humanity? Do you understand that? Do you understand that when you walk this earth, you walk this earth loaded with power? Why? Because you have the power of creation in you. It's all up in you. Ask a man to birth a child. It will never happen. You walk in power in this earth, women. It's all in you. Which is why we can bear things. We can bear big burdens. We can carry our entire families on our backs. You know good and well that some of the men in your life are not doing their job. You're doing job number one, job number two, job number three, job number four. And you carry your family on your backs. How can you do that? Because you're so powerful, women. You matter and you're worth it. Why? Because you are loaded with power. And what I want you women to know is that that power is available to you at all times. In the good times, in the dark times, in the happy times, in the sad times, you reach inside of you and you find your power. And here's what your power says to you. I am a valuable human being on this earth and I'm worth it. Yes. That is what your power says to you every day. It doesn't matter what you did to me. It doesn't matter what you said about me. I am a valuable human being and I'm worth it. That is who I am. And it doesn't matter what the situation is, women, listen to me. It doesn't matter to me what your children did because children do act up. Children do act up. Children will do things. After you carry them, after you fed them, after you loved them, after you were still there after their fathers walked out and you still kept going, after you had to go down to that Hennepin County place and get the welfare and do what you have to do to keep your family going, your children might still turn around and cuss you out. In Somali. Let me tell you something, women. It doesn't matter. You hear what I'm saying? 
you're still worth it. It's just still worth it. And here's what you do. Here's what you do. You go inside of yourself. And you say this to yourself. I was born with power. And nothing that has happened to me is going to change that. I was born with power. And no circumstance around me is going to change that. I was born with power. And I have enough power still left in me to change my situation. Step number one in changing your situation. You just change your mind. You change the thought that comes into your mind. Who exactly do you think put that thought there? That's your thought, sweetie. Now you go up in your mind and you get yourself another thought. You hear what I'm saying to you? Why? You have the power to do so. Please repeat after me. Put your hand on your heart. Repeat after me. When I was born, I was born with power. Now say, say that one more time like you actually were born and you do have power. When I was born, I was born with power. And I have enough power in me right now to change my life. By changing one thought. So you come up against, you come up against some hardships and you will, mamas, you will. Some of you are sitting in hardships right now. Some of you are gonna go home to some hardships. You look at that hardship and you say to yourself, this is a difficult time for me. But I have power. I still have power. I'm still worth it. And I'm going to make a decision right now. Then I'm going to still be happy. I'm going to still go back to work. I'm going to still keep, um, I'm going to still keep a positive perspective. I'm going to still keep loving my family. I'm going to still keep on, you know what, being a community member. I'm going to still keep on doing it. I'm going to still keep going. You hear what I'm saying to you women? Why? Because you have the power to do so. You're worth it. And you have the power to do so, to make that decision, understanding that it is you. It is you. This thing is on you. Now here's, here's, here's you know what? You can be as spiritual as you want to be all day long. But the fact is, is that your creator already gave you the power. Your creator is waiting on you to use your power. Waiting on you to make a decision. Do you want to be happy or not? You got to answer that question. Do you want to persist and be resilient or not? Do you just want to give in? Refuse to give in. Refuse to give in? Refuse to give up. Refuse to give in? Refuse to give up. Where do you go? You go inside yourself and, you're, and you find your power. And you say, my power is my ability to do something about my life right now. Even if it just means changing a thought or writing a note to yourself or picking up the phone and calling your good friend or going in the bathroom and just having a good cry just all by yourself and drink your Somali tea slow while you do it. <laughs> Sip the tea, wah! Sip the tea, wah! Come out there and put your makeup on. Why? You were born with the power to do something about it. You're worth it, women. You're worth it and you matter, and you have the power in you to do something about it. Refuse, say refuse. Refuse, 
refuse to suffer in silence. Refuse to suffer in silence. Refuse to do it. You don't have to, women. You don't have to. I told Miss Fatun, you gather the women and I will come. And if you heard nothing else tonight in these couple of minutes here, I want you to know that you're worth it, you matter, and you have the power in you to do something about yourself. I'm not talking about your husband. I'm not talking about your kids. I'm talking about you. You get a hold of yourself. If I had a longer time, and we will have a longer time, I will come back and I will actually teach, teach, teach you. But tonight, I just want to put some fire in you for you to keep going. Keep going. Stand up in yourself. There is no place for you now to have self-pity. It's over now. Now it's time to do some work and start working on yourself. And then the work will come for your spouse, and then for your children, then for your community. You start working on yourself first. What do you need to do to be healthy? And I want you to start working on that. Now, speaking of healthy, we have these things, and I'm going to have my husband to come up and just talk two minutes about it, is that we do something called pop-up wellness villages for our families and our communities. And literally, we found in the, in the pandemic, that our community wasn't getting them the health and wellness that they needed from practitioners. And so it was my husband's idea to make our office into a clinic. So we do these pop-up wellness villages that when we do them, they're free, you come, and he'll tell you more about it. But I put some wellness things in your bags for you. I have COVID kits in there for you. So you can, you can, for COVID tests, if you need to take some COVID tests home, there's some kits in there for you. I also put masks in there for you. And we also um, have some really beautiful oils in there for you too. But this is my husband, Brother Shane. Hey, you all. I'm so glad that I have an opportunity to be with you tonight and I appreciate it. Uh, I love my people. Even if I don't understand everything you're saying, I still understand, because mm -hmm. it's my people. <laughs> and Fatuma is, telling, Fatuma is telling me to speak up. Um, but to my young brothers who are here, I just want to holler. Um, young African men, they're smart. Mm -hmm. Don't waste time. If Ray Ray don't want to do nothing, leave Ray alone. Mm -hmm. That's my only message for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would just share that these pop-up clinics my wife is talking about have been so helpful um, for people of color who are really, you know, frightened or intimidated by, you know, the medical profession. We mostly get served by Europeans. And so we made a, some partnerships in the community, black nurses and, and others, to provide resources for us. And so <laughs> you, you all know that during the COVID time, things were pretty rough. And it's not over. It, it's just undercover. But now you can test yourself at home. And that's really helpful to do, right? And the tests are in the bag. And also in the bag is... Uh, face masks, just in case you need them. Um, I just want to send nothing but love, though, to all of y'all, and thank you for receiving my wife the way that you did. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you, and have a really good night. Should we do a, a closing affirmation with them? Okay. Oh, everyone on your feet. <clears throat> on your feet. On your feet. <clears throat> This is, an, this is an affirmation. It's called When I Was Born. <clears throat> say it loud, say it proud. OK, and you want to make sure that you own yourself, women. You put your hand on your heart, you own yourself. Totally own who you are. Own your body, your soul, your mind, your spirit. Own it all. It belongs to you. It was given to you by your creator. So you own it, OK? Say it loud, say it proud. When I was born. When I was born. 
that's not loud enough for me because I've been to the Somali market and I, I, know, I, I know what Somali loud sounds like, just so you know. And we have, we have East African girls and girls taking action. I, I know the deal. All right. When I was born, I was born. I was born valuable. When I was born, I was born important. When I was born, I was born lovable. And when I was born, I was born extremely powerful. And no matter what anyone has done to me, no matter what anyone has said about me, no matter what I have done to myself, no matter what I have said about myself, I'm still valuable. I'm still important. I'm still lovable. And I'm still extremely powerful. Give me an extremely powerful. And nobody and nothing can ever change that. I love you all. I'm here for you. Ms. Fatun knows how to find me. Thank you all. <laughs>
And now 2025, that's my 50th birthday, August, that I'm releasing my memoir. And I chose that year so I can celebrate 50th, even though I don't look like anything like 50. No. <laughs> yes, so, and then also this year, May, I will be graduating my bachelor. Right, we have a so, degree. Yes, yes. So you wanna say a few words, my best friend? Uh, well, here's what I got. <laughs> Nobody can touch Verna, but here, here's what I do know, is that we didn't look alike. We didn't talk alike. We didn't grow up the same way. And what we had to make a decision was that we both had had the courage. Could, could you be friends with? Could you trust your heart with? Could you walk across the bridge to somebody else's house, right? And could they walk across the bridge to go to your house, right? So a good friend will walk across the bridge to your house. They'll sit in your living room. They'll enjoy all the things that are there. One of the things that was very funny, one of my favorite memories, is that she couldn't understand why her children wouldn't eat vegetables. I said, why, why is that? And she, she's like, well, I mean, they have this great food, they have this great food. What, I, what, what are they not doing? He said, they're children. It doesn't matter where they are. No children likes to eat vegetables. <laughs> why, why do you think that's just for you? It's at my house too, and it's at her house, in that house. We are all very similar. We are all very similar. We all have tears, we all have dreams, we all get scared, we all try to hide, we all try to be smaller. We all like to hide under here. We don't like crying in front of other people. That part is hard to think that we're more alike even though we look different. Even though we look different. And to trust your heart with somebody that doesn't look like you or talk like you or live in the same place as you, that's really hard. But I will tell you, uh, I'm never more scared than when Fatoon says, I have something important to talk to you about. <laughs> Out of all my friends, I have something really important to talk to you about. <laughs> that I think, oh no, what could it be? Right, here we go, here we go, here we go. It could be anything. And then she'll tell you something really, really stupid, right, really silly, really something that she's like, I'm, I'm, I've got an idea. Really? Okay, well what's the idea? And then she'll just tell you that she's, she's just decided this morning that she's gonna change the world today. <laughs> right? I'm, I've, I've made this decision and we're gonna change the world and I think, okay. Well, I better pack for that. <laughs> <laughs> better pack for that. So the, I think the things I wanna tell everyone about all of these years of having someone um, it, it is to, to say that it never bothered me. I never saw it as an obstacle that my friend couldn't read or write. Well, let's teach you that, right? Oh, well, I can't, I can't, I can't understand the language or I don't want to talk to you on the phone. I need to look at your face. Okay, well, let's do that. Um, it, it is to say, to, to, to lean in, right? to go a little closer, not a little farther, right? It's easy to go farther, but we have to go a little closer. So when you're, when you're, when you're meeting new people, one of the things that it's really easy to get smaller and smaller and smaller, it's a lot harder to get brighter and brighter and brighter. And that's, I think, what you took the courage to do. And it was hard to be bright. And now, whew, she's pretty bright. So thank you all for coming. Um, I, I was late, I had another piece to do, but I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm so proud of all of the successes that are happening in this room. It's really powerful stuff. You guys are dynamite. All right, thanks for two. Love you. Love you. Um, 
I wanted to share those beautiful two ladies who has changed my life because I know, I know this for a fact. Uh, for many years, my friends were not, uh, not they were some non-Somalis. And I learned from them and I learned, how, and of course I know my community and the hard part that I learned was everybody was afraid of every other person, you know? Uh, she doesn't look like me. He doesn't look like uh, her, you know, and him. Uh, we're two different cultures, we're different religions, we're different, we don't dress like, uh, you know, like each other, all of that. We're human beings. We breathe, we live, we die, we sleep. You know, God created beautiful religions and beautiful cultures, but there's only one soul inside of you. And everybody, if you step back and look at the person as the person, not their color, their skin, their religion, their background, their educational level, you can learn so much. My message to you tonight is please be open-minded and get to know somebody that you don't, you don't not familiar with. They might be the person who can change your life. Okay? Thank you so much. We have a beautiful gift here for all of our guests. It was amazing. I enjoyed every one of you, and I'm so glad that you guys all came and staying this late, even though it's a weekdays, and everybody going back to their regular work tomorrow and school and everything. I really do appreciate from the bottom of my heart. Naima, you want to say any, something? Come over here. You want to say something, last words, to close up? And do not please forget, I'm talking to Somali ladies here, please do not forget to check in with a friend, with a neighbor, with another sister, somebody who you feel like is hiding something or under pressure. Check on them. Come on. Okay, guys, we would like just to introduce a new program that we just added, and we are collaborating together, Sam Fam and Women's Wellness and Parenting Support. It will be taking place here, and it will be just for women, adolescents, and anybody at the age of 50 and younger as a 16. This program would not be anything diagnosing or anything like that. The counseling services would not, there wouldn't be a therapist available. However, there would be four mental health practitioners that would be there. And the other thing that would be available for them is the resources. And the most important, there is a food available, and I know everybody likes that. So please come support another sister. Every day there will be a topic that can be shared, and those topics are available everywhere. So we will make sure that we post prior to the event, 15 days, and it will take a place the 20th of March, 4.30 p.m. <laughs> I wanted to add a couple of things. I know because of cultural um, issues that we don't like to share stuff, but here, me and Naima, we're holding a space for you guys to come and speak and talk and heal and get resources and get help. So thank you so much. I do appreciate all of you. Good night.